you too kind on that introduction and it's put a bit of pressure on no doubt. But look, firstly, you know, thank you Western Australian Government and thank you Western Australian people for paying for me to come over here and thank you for your hospitality, you've been most kind. But what I would like to do is just to give you, sort of, as I stand here very nervously, how did I actually end up in this space? And it's a really interesting journey because um, Dave talked about fear and the other side of fear is also greed, those are the two big motivators in, in humans. And I was actually driven by fear and what invariably led me up to this space was way back in 87, my wife and I, we almost faced bankruptcy, we were so far in debt and so far down the toilet that nobody actually just closed the lid. And we did one of probably the first debt restructurings and fights with the banks at the time and we survived. But what that actually taught us to be was really powerful about figures, really powerful about cash flows, really powerful and recording. And that actually drove a strong engagement with the industry that they used to come to our, our, our the share milking operation or farming operation and test various things on us. And so that happened on and off. And then the regional council in about 2007, 2008 came to us and said, look, we want to run a project of what it would take to uh, take dairy farms from whatever nitrogen loss per hectare they are at down to a target of 26 and we were running then um, overseer program and we were sitting about mid 30s and I thought yeah that's an exciting project. One of our two farms which I'll talk about in a minute was already on an organic farm so it was a relatively low um, output farm in terms of both nutrient and, and production. So we thought you know this would be interesting, we'll run the numbers and see what we learn. So what the process was was basically they set up the farms on the farm max modelling, which I understand you have here in Australia, plus Overseer, which is the nutrient um, model that actually measures nitrogen and phosphorus to below the root zone. So they ran these businesses and we were at 35 and said, okay, what are the changes we actually need to make to get to uh, this magic target of 26? And 26 was a figure that somebody had done off the back of an envelope and said, that's where we need to get to in the catchment mm -hmm. so we have no further water deterioration. Anyway, after they converted 20% or 25 hectares of the 70 hectare organic farm to trees, is the only way to get there, and just about broke the conventional farm, it started to wake up very, very quickly that we had an issue on, on our hands. And so that started a whole thought process that the whole community and that were going to be absolutely challenged in this space if the government and the regulators actually continued to move down this path, which, which they did. The second, if you like, wake-up call for me was I was part of a modelling project again set up by the regulator where they set up a virtual trading desk where you had point source discharges, you had the mill, you had the treatment stations and you had dairy farmers that were intensive, you had forestry and you had low intensive operations and then they tested us with various scenarios and we had to operate on a rational basis of how we would do buying and selling phosphorus and nutrient because the thinking was at the time that we'll set up this free market situation around nutrients and we'll have some trading and all the problems will go away that way that the market will create a rational outcome. And I started to think about that and I started to think about our circumstance which was a pretty small farming operation of how that would work in the real world. And just to give you a feel for that, it's sort of probably a 40 hectare dairy farm, mum and dad dairy farm that's been in the family for say two or three generations probably has a capitalisation of somewhere between 2.5 and maybe $3 million on a good day. Just down the road from us, and this is not a criticism of, we've got dairy farming enterprises and one that is quite openly and from public record has a capitalisation, net capitalisation of $330 million. Mm -hmm. So you start looking at the trading options around that and start looking at the prospects of trading if you like what is a scarce commodity for our catchments we're all what we call over allocated there's too much nitrogen too much phosphorus too much sediment too much e coli um, in them and you start thinking who is actually going to capture the resources bearing in mind that the big players literally got lawyers and their people watching this space on a daily basis some of the mum and dad's farms and this is not a criticism of them like to get up milk their cows do their things and they are not even aware these things are happening so that was the start of the fear of the wake-up call of what was this going to do to this business, our business. If this works. Okay, who are we? George and Sharon Moss from Farming Scott. We've 50-50 share milk for, uh, for 10 years. We purchased our own two small uh, dairy farms and a dairy grazing unit. Uh, we've always been strong on business, always been strong on cash flows, always been strong on having a strategy that we actually stick to. And so part of the process that I'm in now is uh, thinking about how do we actually adapt our business there. Things that I'm passionate about, and I tend to get very passionate, might come across, 
is uh, dairy industry and cooperatives. So why did I put up there, and it'll actually come through later, is the cooperative structure in New Zealand, particularly around the dairy industry, is moving very, very strongly to take the lead in this place. We're being proactive, it was said by our previous speaker, you've got to be proactive, not reactive. Dairy industry I'm very proud about has actually led this thing in trying to help farmers change lobbying, creating data so we can engage with the scientists, engage with the um, policy makers of what the impact would be to the, indus uh, to the industry, but also understanding that we have to go through a significant magnitude of change. My observation would be as a society we're really struggling, this is probably the number two or number three political issue in the election that comes up in, in September and we have become polarised right on one extreme that some people see the only solution to this is to get rid of 80% of the dairy cows and I quote um, to others who say well you can't do that with the um, backbone of the land. So um, passion about farming, rural communities and the importance of adapting to change. Um, and meeting the challenges of how do we have a profitable and resilient farms, farmers and healthy ecosystems. And so much of the debate today has been as alternatives, <coughs> one or the other. And so the challenge for New Zealand is how do we actually have both because um, agriculture probably makes a bigger proportion of our GDP, should be able to quote the number than what uh, it does here, but it is obviously very significant in both countries. And please, I'm not trying to tell you how to do it, I'm just going to tell you about our journey. And this saying, I actually love that, along with the Gandhi saying, that the precondition of all economic life takes place in the countryside. doesn't matter how you interpret that. It is a reality. And whether it is because you all had breakfast this morning and got to come here and, and sit down, or whether it is because of the trade and the activities it drives, whichever way you cut that saying, it works. The other part, and it actually came from a Iwi member, which is um, our Maori people, said that um, in a speech to us one day that we don't inherit from the past, we borrow from the future. So as we start as communities and start to think about what sort of planet do we actually want for the next generation. Some of the things being involved in is the Dairy and which is our dairy industry, um, if you like, support group, extension group, uh, all comes together, uh, work with as advisory board on the low end trials. They've done a lot of very good science. The challenge with that, and it's talked about, that farmers tend to discount science done by scientists. The outcomes are valid, and that, but they say, well, that works in your circumstance. Look at the science team that you had behind it. You had the best brains in the business. My circumstance is different. Mm -hmm. Any number of projects, the sustainable milk plans, I'll come to that later. Harry Bush project was um, a project that I initiated back in 2006, 2007 in a time when um, dairy industry was actually struggling for profitability. Farmers were getting quite sort of dejected, depressed, disenchanted, whatever terms you like. And the dairy industry was moving away from one one extension and being the sort of aggressive, arrogant person that I can be, I said, well, if you guys won't do it, I'll do it. And what we did was we looked at what was happening on farms. We had that bell-shaped curve that even in the low returns, some farmers are profitable and others are totally unprofitable. And learned that people get satisfied when you achieve your goals. Goals are a function of choices, choices are a function of profit. So we set ourselves a target that over a three year period of the participating farms that we would lift their profit by 30% through a mixture of on-farm ex extension, through modelling a farm in the local area. So we put a farm up and we made changes on that farm, we got their permission and we would visit that farm three or four times a year and then there was the mass extension model. What we actually achieved on those farms was a $100,000 net profit increase across 50 farms. Exceeded all the expectations. And it was because it was a farmer driven project that used the extension, whereas before extension tells the farmers what to do. So it was allowing every farmer to getting them, what does it take to actually achieve your goals? This amount of milk at this cost, at this price. And then we did a later one in there. Have a stakeholder group, I'll come to later. The Rural Support Trust, and I'll talk just momentarily about that. That is an organisation we've got in uh, New Zealand, voluntary organisation uh, largely, and that works with farming families or rural people that are in distress, and that can be any sort of distress, right from your suicides, accidents, depression, uh, financial woes, you name it, it happens on farms. Why do I raise that? Because 
to get the changes that you want on farms is all about managing people's headspace. Mm. Okay. If you can manage people's headspace and manage them through a change process, which is scary, because what in New Zealand context we are starting to do is challenge their very essence. We're challenging the profitability on their farms potentially. Their farms are part of their soul. It is part of all their energy, all their emotional capital that they invested sometimes intergenerationally. And we're starting to challenge that future. So you've got to be able to get them into the headspace. Okay, <coughs> roughly where we are, we're in the central North Island. Uh, those are the three properties. Gray is one dairy. Uh, Brownie is another dairy and the dry stock unit on the back. Two road frontages and forestry on, on, on the back. Now the um, issue about our location is in terms of nitrogen loss, we probably couldn't have purchased the farm in a worse area. And I'll come to why. Some basic business statistics, this data is, uh, we make all data available and you can um, have that. Uh, we also have quite an extensive share portfolio that we set in the background because it's part of our business strategy. The challenges, we're on very, very free draining soils. They're pumice soils, so a lot of them are less than 2,000 years old, whereas yours are millenniums old, or a lot of them are. Very high rainfall, normally about 1,500 millimetres. The last two years we've been pushing uh, to over two metres, and some of the farms further west have been getting up to around four metres of rain. Um, cold winters, which used to be cold and dry, now they're cold and wet. For the first time in my farming career, we're running into problems with saturation and on an ongoing basis. We're at uh, 360 metres altitude. We used to be climate constant. Rainfall, summer rainfall safe, dry winters made life easy. You could just about write your name on it. Now we have droughts in our context, not necessarily in your context, um, uh, winters, um, and it's become challenging. And of course, when you bring in purchase feeds, that drives your end loss up, it drives your P loss up and you do that to sort of manage your business. If you get shorter grass as we are now, the temptation is to put on more nitrogen and to, to manage that feed, and these are some of the real pressures. Um, but in the catchment, E. coli, sediment and are issues for the catchment. The river that we run into carries the biggest single load of nitrogen and phosphorus into the Waikato River system. So it's the biggest tributary. As a percentage, it's quite low, but volume times percentage gives you total load, and the load is quite high and we will need to operate probably in an end cap. To try to set some context of what we're operating in, in 2014, the government came out with what they called the National Policy Statement on, um, on water. And basically that set some targets for water quality, but the challenge that was around it, it was all flows and all times of the year. And then obviously further science says, well, actually that's actually not achievable because you have floods, you have rainfall events, you have droughts, you have all sorts of things. These things are not happening. Uh, those things happen and that makes that target an achievable target. So in 2017, based on some very good science, um, government science, they rewrote that. And what they did, they said, well, we'll set a percentage of times that the rivers have to meet the swimmable standard, but what we will do, particularly around E. coli, which is the marker for um, bacteria, we will tighten up on that. So your risk of getting infection and swimming in the water will get less but we acknowledge at certain times of the year that the river will not be, or the lake will not be swimmable in because of floods or, or whatever. And I couldn't quote, quote you off the top of my head what those percentages are, but it's a very high percentage. There is a target now that 90% of all water bodies in New Zealand be swimmable by 2040, which is actually not that far away, so you can start to get a feel of the magnitude of that. The government for making those changes came in for massive criticism. And as I say, it's number two or number three political issue this coming election, they said, oh, you've watered it down, that rivers, some people said rivers should be swimmable 24-7, 365. And it's just, in my view, not doable. Uh, get you a bit of a feel for the timeline that we're on. So if you think 2040, 90% of the rivers are swimmable. This is a dairy industry slide, and I thank them for uh, supporting me. Um, you're starting off where we are now, we've got massive public perception problems, particularly in the dairy industry. We've got the water report, I'll talk about that, we'll talk about the national policy statement. So the first step in terms of farms is going to be moving everybody to, uh, to GMP, good management practices. Then in the reality to get to the end goals, we're potentially going to be looking at farm system changes. So whether that's de-intensification or whether that's spending a lot of money on concrete and buildings, um, that 
And the other one, which we're not allowed to talk about, even 18 months, the land use change, and that is openly on the in the discussions now about backwards land use change. That's potentially about taking uh, properties that might be in sheep and beef and grazing, or in dairy, and putting them back in, into trees or even in, into native bush. The other thing that is looming up and is going to be a challenge for us, and most farmers even having thought this far ahead, is the greenhouse gas. Um, challenge and so as an industry we're already starting to prepare farmers for those discussions and what those things might look like and funding an awful lot of science around that so it sort of gives you a feel of what the uh, context that farming businesses are operating in. What is the industry doing? Uh, we did our first accord in 2003, I was a part of that process. Um, this is the voluntary scheme while well, the industry is taking the lead on it a set of good management practices, so you can go on the Dairy NZ website, it doesn't matter what farm thing you've got there, there's a list of tick boxes that you can say, am I at good management practice, I'm not at good management practice. Uh, working on getting the stock out, uh, targeting the riparian plant, equipment management standard for new dairy farms, improving water nutrient use efficiency. Dairy NZ I think throws about $13 million at this annually. Fonterra is now um, putting somewhere around 20, 20 odd million, I think. It could be the figure at this annually. So this this is big. Achievements, 97% uh, of waterways excluded from dairy cattle. 99% of regular stock co crossing points all got bridges and coal fits now. All farms assessed of having good effluent management systems. The challenge around that and the challenge around this space is, and it's been, uh, they've talked upon, you can have the best system in the world, but it's the operator. And the one thing that our, all our work as a dairy industry is starting to show that you've got this bell-shaped curve of farmers. And the biggest driver of outcomes off those farms is the guy pulling the levers or making the decisions. So if you've got the best system and you don't use it right, you still end up with bad outcomes. But if you've got a poor system, you might be actually very vigorous in managing it and you can still end up with a very good outcome. 83% um, of farms have nutrient budgets. Look, that's a great figure, but the reality is unless they are actually managed and used effectively and farmers understand them, it is just a statistic and, and nothing more than that. And since you get in trouble for saying that. Um, off the back of Dairy Bush, we did a thing um, called the Waikato Sustainable Milk Plan Study. And what that was was to see to what extent we can actually scale up, if you like, on farming e extension and start making farmers aware and start getting farmers um, to change. And what this project was, was it was deemed a voluntary project, but um, let's be honest, uh, you know, it, yours truly in that, you know, we strongly encourage farmers to be part, part of it. And uh, if they didn't want to be part of it, unless they absolutely refused, they didn't. And so that was an extension officer, a trained extension officer, went on farm and said, what are the things that you can do, discussion with the farmer, that you can change on your farm in the next three years that's actually going to improve environmental outcomes? And what we actually achieved there, I think it was, um, and bear in mind this is voluntary, about an 8% reduction on nitrogen through modelling and about a 14% reduction on phosphorus. Now the range for phosphorus was from 0 to 75%, so fun far some farmers didn't achieve anything, they were probably a good management practice anyway, and the range for nitrogen was 0 to 35%. Again, some probably could make an improvement, some could make massive improvements. Understand that is measured below the root zone. Waikato River, iconic river, that is the upper Karapiro. Further down, if you have a look at it, there's an international um, rowing place and the challenges for the, uh, the Waikato River, one is there's six big chunks of concrete in it, which has changed the time that the water goes from Lake Kaupo to, to the sea from about three days to around about 27 to, to 30 days. And the hydro lakes in the summer months like to hold the water back because uh, to sell the water for hydro maximise their income of power. And obviously for the rowing venue, the challenge is around algae and, and around weed, and it is a real problem across. Now, the sort of discussions that happen in the community is, oh, we'll get rid of all the cows and the lake will come right. It's just not true. Because what the people need to understand, there is a legacy issue now that even if you physically remove all the stock, there's a nutrient cycle in there now with the background nitrogen and the background phosphorus that will just keep going. And until we actually work out the technology of how we harvest that nutrient and potentially recycle it, we will have a problem. So as part of a project which we'll come to is, you know, how do we actually restore and improve that, that river system. Waikato vision and, and strategy for the Waikato and Waipa rivers. 
Now, probably a key thing around this is to understand in New Zealand context, this is an agreement between the regulator and the five river iwi, so that's the five tribes that uh, used to live along that river, um, endorsed by government, they are mandated as governors of the river system and they came up with a vision and strategy as to what they want to achieve by that. And this is the key word, the future where a healthy Waikato River sustains abundant life and prosperous communities who in turn are all responsible for restoring and protecting the health and the well-being of the Waikato River. Great words. I don't think anybody, when we took it out there, argues against them. The challenge is, how do you actually achieve all those things? Because there is some exclusivity around that. But it was a wonderful thing. So how do we actually go about it? And there's been very, um, various ranges of collaborative processes um, in, in New Zealand. And some have worked um, reasonably well and some have worked better. Uh, this one worked really well. And it was set up with uh, 24 seats. Dairy uh, had two, uh, Maori interest three, NGOs and uh, so forth. The other, if you like, primary sectors all had one seat. And the, we were charged, if you like, with delivering that vision that was at, at the beginning, and this con totally consumed two years of my life. <laughs> it is a bear pit. That's the only thing you can describe it as. It is a bear pit. Especially when we got down to the end. When we did the values exercise and say, well, what did everybody want? Oh, we want clean water, we want healthy ecosystems, we want this and we want prosperous communities. Yeah, we all agree on that. Um, then you get into the, the discussion as which of the contaminants are the, the biggest problem. That gets a little bit more heated because Everybody points the finger at dairy, but everybody wants to be a dairy farmer. So I struggle with that concept. You dairy farmers are bad, but well, by the way, I want to be one too, <laughs> because you're more profitable. Um, but then when it actually starts to come down to what are the solutions are, who's going to do what, then those conversations get really hard. And the challenge around it is, and if any of you are in these processes and you know, or you're supporting champions in these processes, You've got to put a lot of support around them, and I'd say even as far as um, hiring psychologists. Because what happens, you go in there as a, as, a, as a leader and you've got all your team behind you and they say, yeah, good. But then you actually have to start making compromises. You actually have to start giving things away. Then you go back and you tell your stakeholders and explain to them and you discuss what's happening and then they start getting very angry. Mm. And, when, and what Dairy was good at, because I had the support, um, that we were able to hold the line of what we were putting under the table despite some very angry backlash from front of the stakeholders. And for some of the other participants, I feel very sorry because they put stuff on the table and said, yeah, well, that makes sense to us. Then they go back, tell their stakeholders, their stakeholders absolutely string them up. And, you know, it's, it's just horrible. And of course, then they go back and say, well, actually my stakeholders are not happy now. Um, can we um, go for something, something less? So, um, this was our vision statement. We concentrated on four contaminants, nitrogen, pea, sediment and bacteria. If you read them backwards, that is the um, priority of problems. And again, great words, um, but hard to deliver. So where did we end up? We had to do the whole journey to achieve all the outcomes of the river we agreed would actually take 80 years, an 80 year time frame. Um, and the reason for that is, to do it any faster, the social and economic cost got horrendous. Mm -hmm. And to give you the number, um, the full cost with today's knowledge for the Waikato and Waipa catchments, which only makes up, uh, say, half of the Waikato, was about an $8 billion price tag. Mm -hmm. So you are talking big, big coins. So we agreed for the next 10 years that we would look for a 10% improvement across all four of the contaminants. It's been something that we believe that was economically achievable without, if you like, gutting your rural sector and more importantly, gutting your towns. And one thing that I always said, and that, that in any process like this, it's always the poorest people that will pay the price. And I used to put it up there, I used to put the numbers up there, and I said, look, you tell me what to do, I will survive. It's just how many staff I get rid of to do it. And I can do that deep easily. But the good news is, is the modelling indicates that we'd probably achieve a minimum of 30% gain if the plan as it is written is implemented. For some stakeholders, it's way too fast, and we've had that feedback to us. There's over a thousand submissions gone in on this plan. Um, and for others, it's way too slow. There's people that say we should achieve the whole 80 year strategy in, in 10 years. And while the plan is not perfect, I honestly believe that it's probably the best plan that's been written in the country to date 
for balancing the environmental and economic considerations. So what does it look like? So where did we land? And this will probably frighten some of you, it's definitely not a recommendation, and the card that I'll put on the table immediately is the cost of implementing this plan, both in terms of people that have an understanding of it, both in terms of cost to the, the regulator or whatever, is just a big challenge. So even if you said the money's there, how do you get enough people to implement? Basically, we've gone after all properties over two hectares to register with the regulator, the regional council, declaring your activities. Right or wrong. All properties greater than 20 hectares will be either consented, so consent is a right to operate, or part of accredited industry scheme, stock exclusion for all land uses by 2026, right period and setbacks based on slope and activity of one to five metres, farm environmental plans for every farm, moving each farm to GMP for all contaminants, um, which has a cost between 2000 and 10000 Land use change regulated by non-compliant consent. We've had a lot of forestry conversions to dairy in the catchment, and we've had a lot of sheep farms in the last uh, 10 years convert to, to dairy, and obviously some dairy go to horticulture. Now that is a non-compliant activity. It is one step away from being a prohibited activity. So if anybody wants to do that, you have to put a case forward saying that you can do that without any increasing in contaminants. And that is a challenge. That is a huge challenge. And needless to say, there's this big mushroom cloud that's gone up from a big chunks of the sector. For nitrogen, nitrogen is the most politically contentious issue. Farms that are under the 75th percentile, so if you're below, not in the top quarter for nitrogen, you um, move to good management practice. Those that are over have to bring their nitrogen down to the 75th percentile. Uh, I'll just briefly talk on Horizons, um, which is a plan change. It been, they took 10 years to do it. They had little or no community uh, collaboration. They tried to allocate nitrogen on a land use uh, capability. So this type of land gets this amount of nitrogen, and that plan is in trouble, and they've probably got to rewrite it. And even in their own words, they have said that 90% of dairy farmers and horticulturalists, quote, unquote, would probably actually be insolvent under that plan change. So that is stuff that plays with farmers' um, brains. Environmental plans, I won't go through it all, but the adherence to the farm environmental plan will be part of maintaining your consent to operate. So in effect, agriculture now around defuse sources will be treated the same as if you wanted to put a factory up or, or whatever. And this is challenging farmers, you know, they've had generations of generations where you do on your land what you're right, it's called exclusive property rights. And all of a sudden now, the society move is where the collective good starts to outweigh the rights of the individual operator. Now, whether that's good or bad, that's a whole debate, but that is the reality of the world that we're moving into. Um, what does it mean for us on farms? We can, on our, for us as the farmers, we cannot increase our component loss. Cap on end is the reality, a cap on uh, stock and production. We need to manage end down. The way we grow and protect the business will be different. We need to continue strategies and directions and it's easy to put that on there but this is mind-bending stuff it is really and environmental impacts will define production limits and all farm system in the future and as I said before we cannot wait for science that is not criticizing that the science is inadequate or not good enough there's just no silver bullet out there uh, what are we doing complete rethink of the business model um, I've got a picture there of two ponds one is the line pond the other is an unlined pond, obviously we'll uh, line that uh, line pond, uh, we'll increase our effluent area, we'll completely remodel the farm, we will completely look at all that, I'm going through that process literally literally at the moment. And there's cost to that, you know, looking at, all, looking at all the options. But one of the things that I try to do is if we can actually do this on our own farm and if we can actually find a strategy that um, will actually work and deliver the outcomes that people are looking for and make us a resilient business with the sort of people we just always put our numbers we put our farm business out there and we just put all the cards on the table because if people can see it in their own context and Dave's uh, talked about it then people will actually adopt it if it's their own peers doing it um, that, so that's what we're trying to do I was asked to talk about effluent rules um, simple version no more than 150 kilograms in a hectare no runoff no ponding no application on saturated soils Real challenge in the Waikato at the moment. We've spent three months basically saturated. Some soils, no application until there's a soil water deficit, a measurable 
Paddock runoff and depth records need to be kept. It has to be adequate storage based on the pond calculator. Penalties for minor abatement notices, I think there might be a $500 fine attached to that. For major or deliberate um, breaches of that, fines run between about $20,000 and $80,000, and the regulator is um, quite zealous. Um, GMP, there's an example there. We have tick boxes that farmers can walk through. One of the things that we're doing across our farms with our farm staff is they actually need to um, get every business to um, GMP. <coughs> Key messages, understand the problem and also understand the vision. Identify and support the leaders, you call them champions here, and depending on what happens in your state and that, in your, your country, it is absolutely critical you put whatever support around them, whether it be science support, whether it be mental support or whatever, because they will come under a lot of heat. You sign us to demonstrate lead, talk about that. Identify the compelling reasons. And uh, spend some time and you know about asking farmers, you know, what is the, your compelling reason? What is your loan going vision? So you've actually got to start to adopt this stuff or make a conscious decision to exit. Because if you start making it a planned thing, the worst thing that can happen to farming businesses is that they sort of go into denial mode. Maybe it won't happen, maybe we'll see what happens, maybe a government will come in and change it. In New Zealand context, all three of the main political parties are going to hit this thing. The only difference is the speed of that the, the pressure is coming. So for farming businesses, if you don't want to get into this space, an exit strategy may be a real option. First loss is always the smallest loss, end of story. Or you say, well, actually, I'm prepared to operate in this space. This is the way the world's moving, and I can actually see a future in it. And there will be a future in it. Already the marketplace is saying we will pay premiums for some of this stuff. And it's a global, it's a global phenomenon, so I'm quite sure there will be some um, market pricing. You've got to show a pathway. The critics in, in New Zealand, I'd say, you've got to get rid of 80% of the dairy cows. You've got to do this, do that, do the other. They don't put up an alternative. And you can imagine if I stood up there in one of your big grain belts and say, hey, you guys got to get out of grain. You know, nothing more than that. And you know, don't say where they could go to, don't say what the options are, don't say where it goes down. And your first reaction is, you know, you just get marched, marched out. But if you can actually start saying that we're gonna create time, enough time and put support in and create other opportunities of what the future might look like. Support for farmers, this process is stressful. In the horizons where they've mucked it up, I've got no doubt in my own mind, we'll see dead farmers, end of story. Mm -hmm. um, last one, lead is to be proactive instead of reactive. I think that uh, some interesting links which are available to you. Uh, one that, a story of one farmer, Kaupo Catchment, Kaupo allocated in, had a government fund to buy it back. Uh, this guy there has set up his own market, marketing Kaupo beef which is eco-friendly beef, and he's made a whole story around that and created a marketplace. Um, Healthy Rivers, there's plan change, there's River of the Month, there's a lot of good stuff um, absolutely happening. Questions, and then what I've done, I've put my email address up there. I tend to be very open, I'll put more cards on, on the table. Um, if anybody wants to write because they want um, some links or they want some information or they've got some challenges, um, more than happy. That's me. Thank <laughs> you.